Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new around here, hi, my name's Georgia and on my platforms are on the internet, I talk about true crime. Today I want to talk about a case which I'm sure a lot of the more seasoned true crime viewers of mine would have already heard of. It's one I know I'd heard of many times before and I always like to spend time on my platforms talking about maybe the cases that get less coverage. However, with this one, my curiosity got the better of me and I decided to do my own deep dive into this case, finding many facts and details that I hadn't really heard mentioned before. So here we are. This is the case of Lars Matank, who at 10 a.m. on Monday, July 8th, 2014, ran out of Varna Airport in Bulgaria at high speed, as captured on CCTV footage that went viral across the internet. And he's never been seen again. In my research for this one, I realised that we're really dealing with two big mysteries here, two big questions. Number one, what is it that caused Lars to spook and run away from the airport? And two, where is he now? Like, what happened to him after this point? Sadly, I don't have any answers for you, but I'm going to tell you his story. And hopefully one day, they will find out what happened to Lars Matang. From all my research, Lars seemed to be like an all-round, very loved, but very regular guy. He was born near Berlin in Germany on the 19th of February 1986, but would grow up in Itzehoe in northern Germany with his family, who he was very close to. I am going to be butchering a lot of German and Bulgarian words in this video, you have been warned. Lars loved his family and he would do anything for them, even when he ended up having to move three hours away for work, like he still made the effort to come home all the time. You see, Lars never went to traditional university after school like the majority of his classmates. He chose the less traditional route of attending advanced training classes where he trained to become a power plant operator and he actually ended up receiving top marks. Around 2007, he got a great job at Wilhelmshaven Power Plant, meaning he did have to move three hours away, but he stayed in very close contact with his parents. He went home to visit them all the time. When his dad had a stroke, he would actually travel home most weekends just to help his mum out before travelling back ready for work on Monday. He was a dedicated son doing a six hour round trip every weekend. He was somebody who really loved those closest to him, but he also loved his job as well, so he made it work. And alongside his family and his career, the other big love of Lars' life was football and his favourite team, Werder Bremen, the green and whites. He was the kind of guy that you would cut him open and he would just bleed football. He was dedicated to his team. It was a big part of who he was as a person. It was how he let his hair down. He went to as many matches as possible. He spoke about it all the time. Like he wore the football kit when he could. Like he loved football. Football was just the big love of Lars's life. Well, that and traveling, which he also loved to do. We're very lucky here in Europe that it's so easy and relatively cheap just to pop across the continent and explore new places, new cultures, something Lars always made sure to do. In 2014, a group of school friends of his decided to organise a trip to Bulgaria. And this trip wasn't quite the usual thing that Lars liked to do because Bulgaria isn't necessarily seen as a cultural destination. It's more of a party place. I mean, especially the area that they were planning on travelling to. But Lars had never been on a lad's holiday before and he just wanted to get away with his friends, let loose a little bit after all the stress recently. Like, he deserved this. Their chosen destination would be Golden Sands, a major seaside resort town on the Bulgarian Black Sea coast in Varna. It's got this gorgeous beach, lots of hotels, plenty of bars and cheap alcohol, all in the summer sun and much, much cheaper than somewhere like Ibiza. So what more could they ask for? So on June 30th, 2014, Lars and five friends head off on their holiday, checking into the four star Hotel Viva for the next few days. And they settled into the holiday life very quickly, swimming, sunbathing, party at night and plenty of football of course. The World Cup was on that summer, it was the best time for any football fans and the semi-finals were playing in all the bars in the week they were there. So they spent a lot of time in the bars drinking, watching the football and when they weren't watching the football, Lars was often on the beach playing football with locals. Like I said, he loved it. A few days into the holiday, on the 5th of July, the group went to a local bar, as they did every night, to watch the Costa Rica versus Netherlands match. Lars went dressed in his Werder Bremen kit, they took along German flags, and they were exchanging them with all the other bar goers of all nationalities. It was just this really fun, happy environment. 
But as can often happen when it comes to the world of men's football, there was violence bubbling beneath the surface. You see, there was another group of German men in there, but they were Bayern Munich fans who are staunch rivals of Lars's beloved Green and Whites, and these men pick a fight. There ends up being a small argument at the bar, but luckily nothing that really escalates at that point. And Lars and his friends would actually be the last ones to leave the bar that night. Most of the group, before doing so, decided they were hungry. They wanted to stop off at a 24-hour McDonald's on the route home. Now, sources tended to differ as to what exactly Lars did at this point, but what we do know is Lars wasn't hungry. His friends would later say that whilst Lars was acting completely normal for the vast majority of the holiday, they did notice that he just wasn't really eating. He was just eating small plates and picking at salads, which was a bit unusual for him, but like not enough of an issue that they raised it at the time. They weren't super concerned at the time. It's just one of those things in hindsight, they noticed it. It could just be that flying through his stomach off, maybe he was nervous, maybe flying just didn't agree with him. I know that can happen to me and I usually struggle to eat properly for the first couple of days of any holiday. Or it could have been something else entirely. Maybe he just genuinely wasn't hungry in the sun. So whilst his friends were ordering their McDonald's, Lars either decided just to like wait back a little bit or he decided to start the one kilometer walk back to the hotel alone. And this is one of the issues with covering cases from other countries because whilst there is a decent amount of English coverage of this case, the most detailed stuff will be in his native German, maybe even Bulgarian, and Google Translate only takes me so far. So if there are any details I may have missed and you speak German or Bulgarian and you know this case better than I do, please feel free to leave a comment. But either way, his friends went to McDonald's, Lars found himself alone, and in that time, he got in trouble. Luckily, he did walk away generally unharmed, except for a blown eardrum that was caused by a blow to the head. Lars got back to the hotel, he put himself to bed, and the next morning he would share with his friends that he thought the Bayern Munich fans from the bar earlier that night hired these men to beat him up. Apparently, during the confrontation, these men had made a comment about how easy it was to hire people to beat others up in Bulgaria, so it kind of matched up. Lars's friends didn't really know what to think at this point because he didn't look like he'd been beaten up, like nobody had seen it, but he was undoubtedly experiencing a lot of discomfort with his right ear. He was complaining of pain and hearing loss. When he called his long-term girlfriend back in Germany that morning, she asked him to go and get his ear checked out by a doctor, but Lars was very hesitant to do so. He thinks it will heal naturally, and he isn't sure where it would be open to see a doctor at the weekend, plus just seeking medical help in a foreign country is a scary thing to do. Like, you don't know how the systems work, you've got to deal with your travel insurance, it's just a faff, there's only a couple of days left of the holiday, he said, he thought it was gonna heal fine. The rest of the weekend goes ahead without any major drama, but it does become clear that his ear is just getting worse and you can't fly with ear problems. A little personal anecdote here, which I swear is relevant. I'm actually hard of hearing in my own right ear. I have a hearing aid that I have to wear out and about. I don't usually wear it in videos because I don't need to hear anything. But although we don't know exactly what caused my hearing loss, I am almost 100% sure that it started when I was 14. I went to Spain for two weeks, spent ages in the pool, I got an ear infection, and then I flew home. And I will never forget that pain of being on the airplane. Although I didn't notice any hearing loss at the time, like I was 14, I'm so sure that that's where it began. So whilst Lars's friends might have thought he was being a little bit overdramatic when he told them that he was worried about flying with a bad ear, he probably had a right to be. Like, besides, for his job, he needed to have really good hearing. He couldn't damage his ears. On Monday, July 7th, which is the day they're supposed to be flying home, the group checks out of Hotel Viva, and Lars finally decides that maybe he should go see a doctor. He's still in quite a lot of pain. He goes to see a local GP and sure enough, he's diagnosed with a ruptured eardrum. He's advised not to fly and is then referred to the local hospital, St Anne. First though, he goes back to the hotel where his friends are waiting to leave for the airport. He informs them that he's not gonna be able to fly and tells them to head on home without him, which they do agree to do. I've seen a lot of discussion around this on the internet, like people are really outraged that his friends would go back home leaving him alone. But from what I can gather, like Lars really insisted. In this same situation, as a female, would I leave a friend alone in a country where they're seeking medical help? Absolutely not in a million years. 
but we don't know the details here. We don't know how much Lars insisted. It seems like it was a lot. We don't know if people offered to stay and he told them like, no, don't just go home. It's probably not fair to place blame on the friends because at this point, Lars was still acting completely fine. He just had a bit of ear pain. We all make choices in this life. In hindsight, Lars's friends probably made the wrong one, but they weren't to know at that moment and they felt intense guilt ever since. I don't know, I've just seen some really harsh and awful commentaries on the friends during my research and they had no way of knowing what was going on. He was a grown man, they probably thought he was safe. Men don't really see the dangers in the world like women do. It's, it's a difficult one. So his friends are picked up by the shuttle bus at around 8 p.m. at which point Lars says goodbye and gets into a taxi on his own. He goes straight to the local hospital in Varna. After a short wait there, he's seen by an ENT doctor called Dr. Boris Najdanao at 8.40 p.m. who gives him a prescription for a drug called Cefprazil, a common antibiotic for ear infections. He receives the drug in the brand name Cefzil 500, 500 milligrams. Very interestingly, this drug was not licensed for use in Germany, so it's not something Lars would ever have taken before this point. Some reports do say that the doctor was very dismissive of Lars and refused to communicate with him in English, so there was a very big language barrier there. Some also say that Lars was supposed to be checked into the hospital for care, but for whatever reason, that didn't happen. So Lars leaves, he gets back into the taxi and goes to a couple of different pharmacies before he's able to get his hands on the drugs that he needs. And this is when things start to get a little bit weird. Obviously knowing that he's gonna have to spend another night in Bulgaria, Lars needs to find a hotel to stay in. Only this is peak summer season and everywhere is pretty booked up. He ends up having to book a stay at a place called Hotel Colour in the downtown area of Varna, which is definitely one of the rougher areas of the city. But hey, he just needed a place to rest his head so he could figure a way back home in the morning. It was close to the airport here and his taxi driver recommended it. So why not? It's just one night. So Lars checks in and he pays with his credit card, noting that the person at the front desk copied the details on his card as they did so. And this unsettled him, so he'd never seen anyone do this before in any hotel that he checked into. Around 11pm he goes up to the hotel bar and fills up his water bottle so he can take his antibiotics. And then he goes back to his room and calls his mum Sandra, informing her of everything that had gone on that day. Only by the time he's on the phone to her, he's seeming a bit strange, a bit paranoid. He tells her that something is wrong with the hotel and he doesn't feel safe, that somebody was going to hurt him. He then tells her that he's running out of minutes on his phone, so asks her if she can pay for more for him, which of course she does agree to do. Now this was 2014 and by this point most phones didn't necessarily have minutes that needed topping up, but when Lars travelled he left his fancy smartphone at home and just travelled with a cheap one, he obviously put enough minutes on it for the duration of the holiday, he'd been rationing them, now he was staying an extra day, he needed more minutes, like it made sense. On this same phone call they also discuss how he's going to get back home, like if he can't fly, and Sandra tells him that she'll get on the phone with his travel insurance to see if there's anything they can do, but she's unsuccessful. She then calls him back to let him know, but it's very clear that his behaviour is getting stranger by the minute. Now he's telling Sandra that she needs to cancel all of his credit cards because the front desk copied it. Like, imagine being a mother in this situation. Your child is clearly having a breakdown thousands of miles away in a different country. There's nothing you can do except for listen and just try and fix what you can on your end. So Sandra agrees that she'll call the bank and see if they can cancel his credit cards and then maybe reopen them later because obviously she doesn't want him stuck in another country with no access to money. But the banks say that's not possible. When she repeats that back to Lars, he says he doesn't care, he has plenty of cash on him, just do it. So she does. She also books Lars a bus out of Varna for the following night, 11.30pm on July 8th. She tells him she's got it all under control, he just needs to rest and get a good night's sleep and they'll get him home tomorrow. 
But after midnight, he then calls her again, saying this hotel room had been wiretapped, that something was really, really wrong with this hotel. He's clearly spiraling, and Sandra then decides to book him a flight for the next day anyway. Like, so what at this point? If it causes damage to his ear, she'd rather just have him back home safe and sound. I think any mother would do the same. Like, she is just back at home, frantically trying to help her son from the other end of the phone. That's like, it's all she can do. Between 2.30am and 3pm, he calls her again, saying that he's being followed by three men who want to kill him. At 3.06am, he texts her asking what Cefcil 500 is, and then repeats it again nine minutes later. Clearly now he's having some worries about the medication that he's been prescribed, and he might not be wrong to. It's been pointed out many times over the years that it might not be a coincidence that Lars's paranoia only seemed to surface after he started taking the antibiotics, or after we think he started taking the antibiotics. I did some research into the potential side effects of Cefprazil or Cefzil, and honestly, pretty much everything possible is listed for this. Like, talk about covering their back. Chest pain, diarrhea, fever or chills, back pain, shortness of breath, swollen glands, tiredness, weakness. Rarer, we have bleeding gums, hives, swelling, rashes, vomiting, weight loss, and more. Like, there are so many potential side effects here, but if you scroll down to the very bottom of this page, you'll see some psychological symptoms noted. Confusion, nervousness, restlessness, inability to sleep. Could Lars have potentially been one of these very unlucky people to suffer these rare side effects? I mean, even then, I think what was happening to him maybe exceeded your regular confusion and nervousness. Like, he was downright paranoid. Poor Sandra is stuck at home, not having a clue what to do, but, like, at least Lars is in contact. What she didn't know at the time is that he actually fled the hotel in the early hours of the morning. Hotel staff saw him leave with his bags. At 5am he hailed a taxi and asked to be taken to Varna Airport. And there was already another passenger in this taxi, but Lars apparently looked so distressed that they agreed to pick him up. The other passenger would later say that his pupils were severely dilated, like he did not look okay. He was dropped off at the airport around 6am where he calls his mum yet again, informing her that he made it to the airport. He then asked her to transfer him 500 euros through Western Union. Now this request really surprised Sandra, who had never used Western Union before, and was surprised that Lars knew how to use it himself. It would later turn out that Lars had spoken to somebody at the airport and learned how to use it. Regardless, Sandra agrees to send him the money on one condition. He goes to the medical office at the airport just to make sure that he is all good to fly. But she also gives him the bus information just in case he isn't. During this time, they're just on and off the phone constantly. There's one call where Lars tells her that he's been told that he's not allowed to fly or drive. But confusingly, at this point, he hasn't been to the medical office. Like, no one has told him that. He also tells her that he's all dishevelled from travelling, so Sandra tells him to go to the bathroom and clean up, just refresh himself, and then call her back. Which he does, but this time she only hears unintelligible whispers before the call cuts off. And that is the last time she would hear from her son. She tried to call back again multiple times, but just doesn't hear anything back. However, Lars is still okay at this point, or at least he's functioning. Only now does he go to the medical office as requested, and he meets the Dr. Costow who examines him. He takes his temperature, looks into his ears. Costow would later say that Lars looked very uncomfortable, he was fidgeting, he kept muttering to himself that he didn't want to die, he just didn't really seem okay. He said he tried to give Lars some more tablets, but he refused them, so instead hands over some medicinal eardrops. He also advises him not to fly for 7-10 to 10 days, but if he wanted to fly, all he had to do was sign a waiver and he was good to go. Lars apparently seemed happy enough about this, says he will absolutely sign the waiver, he just needs to use the bathroom first. And then, he bolts. Some other sources have a slightly different version of events. Some say that instead a construction worker from the airport walked into the consulting room and that's when Lars bolted. But either way, he left everything behind as he did so. His passport, his wallet, his phone, his luggage. He left it all in that doctor's office and just ran. The CCTV footage of Lars's next movements have been viewed millions of times all around the world. Him just running through the airport, shocked onlookers watching as he did so. There's no one following him, no one tries to stop him, he's going too fast, he just 
runs. By this point, it's 10 a.m. He runs straight out of the airport and once outside, he does sort of slow down to a walk for a bit, seemingly trying to figure out his route before then breaking into a run again. Witnesses watch as he climbs over an eight foot high fence into a sunflower field on the other side. And we all know how tall sunflowers can grow, like all of the ones in this field were over two meters high. So as soon as Lars entered this field, he was hidden from view. And from there, no one's ever seen him again. Lars Vertank is five foot nine, about 180 pounds, an average build with blonde hair, brown eyes, and a wide nose. He was 28 years old at the time he went missing, and today he would be 38 years old. He's officially classified as endangered missing. Sandra has since said that the footage released to the public isn't all of it. She's seen additional footage investigators seem to be keeping back to themselves, in which she says Lars seems much more level-headed. He swerves two police cars to avoid capture at one point, which she says makes it seem like he was sort of thinking more clearly than the release CCTV implies. But there's no way of verifying this information unless the authorities decide to release it. Running the other side of the sunflower field which Lars disappeared into was the A2 highway, which could have taken him anywhere were he able to hitch a lift off someone. Despite the huge amounts of media coverage in this case over the past decade, no one has ever come forward admitting to picking Lars up that day. Which, if they picked him up and brought him to harm, could make sense. But honestly, at this point, what are the chances of him coming across somebody who wanted to harm him, a grown man? Like, how much bad luck can one person have? But if he did jump into a car on the lane closest to the field, that road would have taken him back towards Varna. If he crossed the road and got into a car on the other side, then he would have headed towards Sofia, Bulgaria's capital, which is all across the other side of the country. But really, from that side of the road, he could have gone anywhere in Bulgaria, or even anywhere in surrounding countries like Romania, Serbia, North Macedonia, Greece. I mean, even technically, he was sort of travelling in the correct direction to get back to Germany, but that would have been a long, long journey. But the truth is, no one knows what happened to Lars after this point, after the point he jumped over the fence into the sunflower field. You can imagine the field and the surrounding areas have been intensely searched over the years and they have just found nothing. But back to the day in question, Sandra is still desperately trying to get in contact with her son. She transferred the cash as he'd requested, but she's getting more and more concerned by the minute now because he is just not answering his phone. She'd been trying to placate him for the last almost 12 hours now, he was getting increasingly paranoid, and now he wasn't even answering the phone, like she didn't know what to do. So what she does do is contact the German consulate in Varna and she tells them what had been going on. She asks them can they do some research on their end, just make sure all is good at the airport, make sure he's getting on that plane. But soon after, Sandra gets called back and is informed of his escape, how he'd just run from the airport. In that moment, the investigation truly began. The Bulgarian police were alerted and they went straight in to search for him. They even brought in search dogs, but there was nothing. The investigators took a look at his luggage. Maybe they thought he was smuggling drugs and panicked at the last second, but they found nothing suspicious in his bags. They looked at his bank account and found that 500 euros sat there completely untouched. The whole situation was just incredibly, incredibly strange. Obviously, Sandra decides that she needs to go to Varna herself, which isn't the easiest thing for her to do because she needs somebody to care for her husband who required round-the-clock care, but she soon makes arrangements and gets on a plane herself after officially reporting her son as missing to the German authorities. So now Germany and Bulgaria are both searching for him and they got in contact with Interpol, the international police. Once in Bulgaria, Sandra wastes no time in searching for her son. She and friends distribute flyers across Varna and talk to as many locals as possible. She visits hospitals and morgues in search for the answer, but she never finds anything. And I mean anything. As I said, Lars went into that sunflower field and just disappeared. There were no clues left behind. There was no evidence to analyse. Just the story of the doctor at the airport and the footage. Eventually, Sandra did have to return back to Germany as she had her husband to care for and there was only so much she could do on the ground, but she raised awareness from home as much as possible and a private investigator, Andreas Gutig, was sent out to Bulgaria to search. He said he repeatedly watched the airport video, he contacted hospitals and homeless shelters, he handed out missing persons flyers, but never had any leads. 
Back at home, Sandra's friends also helped to set up a Facebook page she could use to share Lars's story in the hope that people would come forward with potential sightings. But there was one problem with this and that outside of Golden Sands and the main parts of Varna, the people living in this area were often very poor with very little access to modern technology. Lots of people in this area just wouldn't have had TVs or smartphones in which they would have seen the news about Lars's disappearance, let alone to report it if they'd seen something odd. It's not crazy to think that maybe people did come into contact with Lars somewhere, but why would they just report to the police if they had no idea what was going on? But what I think is important to bear in mind is Lars did not speak Bulgarian. He spoke German and a good level of English it seems, so people likely would have paid attention if they came across a man acting strangely speaking a foreign language. Like that would stick in people's heads. If the story of Lars did reach those people, maybe they would remember something, but we are a decade on now. In fact, it is reported that some of the more rural police stations in the area weren't informed about Lars' disappearance for months, so who knows what could have been missed in that time. Lars was very much an outdoorsman, he had knowledge on how to hunt, fish and trap. It's not completely out of the question that he may have been able to survive in the wilderness for a very short time at least, although with his mental state that is questionable, alongside the very hot Bulgarian summer followed by the very rough Bulgarian winter. So even if he did survive, could he have survived out in the open? We don't know. But there have been a couple of sightings reported over the years. In September 2014, three separate people apparently came forward claiming to have seen a man of Lars's description in the Varna area. And after questioning, investigators reportedly agreed that this was him. It seemed to be decent enough proof that he was still in the area two months after his disappearance. But despite that, he was never found. A year later, a Bulgarian truck driver came forward reporting that he'd picked up a hitchhiker matching Lars' description not long after he disappeared. He was a dishevelled looking young man apparently, but the truck driver didn't think anything of it until he saw a missing persons poster. By that point, many months had passed and there was no way of verifying if this was true. Like the truck driver couldn't even remember where he dropped the man off. So what are you meant to do with that? There have been multiple people stopped over the years that match Lars' description, a few homeless people in the Varna area, but again, none of them turned out to be him. Two years on, in December 2016, it did seem like there was a break in the case when police in Porto Velo in Brazil, which is literally the other side of the world, found a man walking along the highway with no socks and no shoes. The man was confused, he seemed lost and was generally in a very bad state, and authorities asked him what his name was, but he didn't seem to know. They posted a photo of this man in his hospital bed in an attempt to get an identity, hoping somebody would recognise him, and almost immediately the public started throwing Lars's name out there, because the man did match his general build after all, he had blonde hair, it very much could have been him. However, it would eventually turn out that he was a Canadian man called Anton Pilipa, a humanitarian worker who had gone missing around five years earlier. Anton was reunited with his very relieved family, and although this wasn't Lars, it did give his mum some hope. If Anton went missing for five years and turned up alive, there was hope for Lars as well. And with no evidence that Lars died, is it better to live in the hope that he's out there somewhere, or do you just tell yourself that he's gone and move on? Like, what is the lesser of two evils there? All of which brings us on to some theories. And saying that takes me back to the earlier days of this channel. I don't necessarily talk theories on here anymore because I don't feel like that's always very helpful. I think plain hard facts are just better so we're not sent on these wild goose chases. But I do think in this case, there are quite a few things to explore, like maybe just to bear in mind in Lars's case. The first is something we've already explored a little bit, and that is the theory that Lars was experiencing some rare side effects of his antibiotics, causing him to experience delusion and hallucinations. From what we know, his symptoms only seem to start after he took his first tablet, or after when he should have taken his first tablet, because there is question as to whether he even started on this medication at all. Dr. Kostov from the airport medical office recalled that when Lars came in to see him, he said he hadn't taken any of the antibiotics at all. In fact, he hadn't even filled out the prescription. However, there are other sources that say that he did indeed go to the pharmacy, so I don't have a solid answer on that for you. 
So much of this case is just speculation and contradictory sources, but what we do know is that when he was offered more drugs by the doctor, Lars turned them down. So either he was already paranoid about something, but had the state of mind to turn down drugs, knowing they wouldn't help, or he'd already taken drugs and had the state of mind to know that that was what was causing his thoughts, and so didn't want to take more. We also know that he texted his mum the night before about Cefcil 500. So did he want to check the side effects before he took them or had he already taken them and was feeling weird? Maybe he wanted to see if they could cause such a thing. I did also do some research into Cefprazil and alcohol, like mixing the two, as we do know Lars was drinking very heavily that weekend, although we don't know anything about the night in question. WebMD states that the drug may make you dizzy, which can be further compounded by alcohol or cannabis. It does advise that you limit alcoholic beverages whilst on this antibiotic, although it doesn't say categorically not to drink at all, so we don't know. If I had to take a guess, I'd say that Lars had started taking the antibiotic already and he was experiencing some weird side effects, like this is kind of the theory that makes the most sense to me, and clearly he had his own suspicions, I don't know. But if not the antibiotics, then many people speculate that a head injury could be the cause of his behaviour, which in my mind is actually equally as likely. I know I just said that I'd probably lean towards the drug theory, but also saying this out loud, head injuries can make people act in all sorts of bizarre ways. The term head injury in itself is actually quite broad. It means just generally an injury to your brain, skull or scalp, and it doesn't always refer to like a visible injury. Brain injuries are incredibly dangerous because you can't see them from the outside and often you don't know about them until it's too late. Lars said he was beaten up that weekend and seeing as no one was there when it happened, we don't know exactly what happened. But we do know without question, he did have an injury to his ear. So we know that he did likely receive a blow to the head of any form, whether that was a fall or a punch. According to Hopkins Medicine, even mild head injuries can cause confusion, problems with memory and or concentration, and change in sleep patterns, all things it could be argued that Lars had. Moderate to severe head injury can cause loss of short-term memory, behaviour changes, and dilation of one or both pupils. If you recall, the other passenger in the taxi that night said Lars's pupils were noticeably dilated. It is incredibly likely that the blow to the head caused some kind of brain injury that just took a full day to show, maybe as the brain swelled in the skull or there was some type of bleed. I am obviously not a doctor, I can't diagnose him with this for sure, nobody can, but it definitely is a possibility. In regards to the theory surrounding his paranoia, a lot of people also just talk about general mental illness, a lot of speculation around schizophrenia. According to the NHS, schizophrenia is often described by doctors as a type of psychosis in which a person may not be able to distinguish their own thoughts and ideas from reality. The symptoms can include hallucinations, delusions, muddled thoughts and speech, losing interest in everyday activities, not wanting to look after yourself and your needs, wanting to avoid people and feeling disconnected from your feelings or emotions. It could well be argued that Lars was displaying some of these symptoms. The exact cause of schizophrenia is still unknown to this day, but most experts do believe it's caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Some people are just innately more vulnerable to developing it and certain situations can trigger this condition, such as stressful life events or drug misuse. I thought this last point was particularly interesting. It could be argued that Lars having to seek medical attention and remaining alone in a foreign country could be a stressful life event. But was it stressful enough to cause schizophrenia to come on so suddenly? His friends have said that he seemed absolutely fine when they left him. Had he been distressed, they would have remained behind to help, but he was fine, insisting they go home. He wasn't anxious, he wasn't nervous, he wasn't freaking out. It was just one of those things. But something we do know is that Golden Sands is a party capital of Bulgaria. It's a place with a huge overconsumption of alcohol, and plenty of drugs. Now we don't know if Lars took drugs that weekend, if he did, his friends have never said, but if he did, that could be a possibility here. Cannabis, cocaine, LSD, and amphetamines are apparently shown to increase the risk of developing schizophrenia or psychosis. 
although I don't know if that's sort of one-off use or consistent use. Like I said, there is zero evidence that Lars did take anything that weekend. I don't think he was a drug person generally, but maybe he had taken something and either it triggered schizophrenia or he was just having particularly bad side effects. Some drugs can literally change your brain chemistry. Again, I want to stress this is pure speculation, but it's just something to be considered. Was he taking drugs? Could that have triggered something? But if Lars was suffering from schizophrenia, this was a really bad time for it to rear its head, although it does often show up for people in their 20s. If this happened at home, he may have had access to help, he may have been able to think a bit clearer, but he was in a foreign country, surrounded by people who didn't speak his language. Maybe all of this just compounded and he just panicked and ran. I think he'd have to be really unlucky to get his first bout, for lack of a better word, of schizophrenia in Bulgaria on his own, but this whole story is unlucky. And the final potential reason for his paranoia is that maybe he had a genuine reason to be paranoid. As I've stressed a lot, nobody was there when Lars got attacked, if we even believe that he did, and I think I do believe it. We don't know what was said to Lars, we don't know what other threats were made. Is it out of the question that this group of men made threats? They really were following and watching him. I know it sounds like something out of a movie, I'm aware, but I don't think it's something that can be entirely discounted. It really could happen. However, Lars was on his way home, out of the country, where you can assume he would have been safe from his attackers. So if this was the case, he was genuinely being followed, you'd think he'd be raring to go and get on that plane to get back home to Germany, not run out of the airport. No, I do tend to think something more was going on, but I really don't think this is a theory that should be discounted. He really could have been paranoid for good reason. But all of that only covers half of the mystery of Lars Matank, why he was so paranoid, why he ran out of the airport. It doesn't cover the mystery of where he is now, what happened to him after leaving the airport, because most of the time, missing people are found. Lars just disappeared. If you ask me, there are three main options here. One, he went out into the mountains around Barna Airport and quickly succumbed to the elements, maybe he's still out there somewhere. Two, he was taken, there's lots of speculation around human trafficking groups operating out of this area. And three, he's still alive, just in a very bad state. We'll start by exploring the latter, and I really can't help but think about an episode of Grey's Anatomy here, which I know is fully fictional, I know that, but there's an episode of Grey's where a Jane Doe comes into the ER and she's clearly suffering with a very severe form of schizophrenia, and she has no idea who she is. Eventually they found her identity through the serial number on a pacemaker she already had fitted, I think, and her parents arrived at the hospital saying they thought she'd been abducted from college a decade beforehand. They searched for her for years and years and years, but they thought she'd been taken. But here she is now, alive, although not entirely well. Again, I'm aware that Grey's is fiction, but this is something that can happen in real life. Just think back to the Canadian man I mentioned earlier who was missing for five years only to be reunited with his family. Could it be that Lars is alive somewhere in the throes of mental illness, potentially having forgotten who he is and how to get back home? Of course it is possible and missing people turn up every single day. But it is unlikely in this case. Like, how would he have just lived off the land for the last decade? Is he maybe relying on the kindness of people? Is he just scavenging? Like, it's really, really unlikely that he could survive out in Bulgaria in the wilderness. Again, he doesn't speak the language, he doesn't know anyone. It's been a decade. Moving on, in terms of the human trafficking theory, this is one that a lot of people consider because apparently this area of Bulgaria just isn't very safe. Now I've fallen into the trap many times before of reading some comments online and making up my own mind as to how safe or how dangerous an area is, only to be thoroughly corrected in the comments. So I really don't think you can truly know unless you live in an area how safe or not it is. That being said, I'd love to hear from any Bulgarian viewers I have. Varna, the Golden Sands area, safe, not safe, like what's going on there. I read comments of there being a lot of gang activity in this area and a lot of underground drug rings, which could make sense as this is a party location with a lot of tourists to sell drugs to, but every city has drug rings. One source, Fizaka, states that Bulgaria has one of the highest rates of human trafficking in the European Union, with locals and tourists having been taken against their will and being forced into sex work, drug smuggling or slavery. There's even talk of the black market organ trade, people being killed for their organs. 
it sounds insane, but these things do happen. Maybe not as common as the media might make you think, but they do happen. It could well be that the men who attacked Lars that weekend were involved in trafficking rings, especially if they were paid to beat him by the German school leavers, which is what Lars thought. There's no way to prove if the trafficking theory is true or not, there's no evidence of this, but there's no evidence of anything here. It could be a reason as to why not a single sign of Lars has ever been seen, but all these theories could be. One thing that keeps coming to my mind was Lars potentially forced to be a drug trafficker, was he given drugs to basically ingest or put up inside himself and then once he was in the airport he freaked out and ran and then he was maybe caught by the traffickers. It sounds crazy, it does happen. Sadly the most likely theory is probably that Lars just isn't alive today. To the east and southeast of the airport is Varna itself but in all other directions you're just looking at the wilderness, mountains, agricultural land. There are small towns here and there but it's mostly just green space. If Lars ran out to the country, the most likely scenario is that he did eventually succumb to the elements and his remains are still out there somewhere. There's also the river, I think. Maybe there's a large body of water that leads out to the sea. Is that out of the question that he could have ended up in there and his body's just never washed up? It's clear that Lars was paranoid, that much we know. The rest, it remains a mystery. But Lars's family are not gonna give up searching until they have answers. The footage of Lars running out of the airport has been viewed millions of times by people all around the world, but it's never relinquished any answers, any clues. There's just nothing. I hope one day soon Lars's family can get the answers that they so deserve. I hope something comes up in this case because Lars truly just vanished into thin air. Like there's never been a single sign of him, but somebody must know something. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what I'm doing here on my channel, then please make sure you leave a comment down below. It really, really helps out with the algorithm. Give this video a thumbs up, interact with it in any way you can. If you're not subscribed, maybe think about subscribing. If you are subscribed and you fancy becoming a channel member, you can do so for just £2.99 a month and you'll get early access to all my videos. You will get opportunities to chat with me. I will see your comments. It's a lovely little community we have going. So maybe think about it. Might be nice. Um, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.